Hi, and welcome to Pope Chapel of Greenville, a church based upon four pillars, preaching the authority of God's Word without apology, lifting high the name of Jesus through worship, believing firmly in the power of prayer, and sharing the good news of Jesus with boldness. We hope that today's message is a point of spiritual growth for your life. And now, here is Pastor Will with today's message. I want to begin with this thought and this understanding. Depression is a problem in the United States. I just want to read a couple of stats for you to help you to see. Major depressive disorders affect approximately 14.6 million adults in America. About 6 0.7% of the American population has depression, ages 18 and older, in any given year. While major depression disorder can develop at any age, the median age set onset is 32. Major depressive disorders is more prevalent in women than in men, and as many as 1 in 33 children, 1 in 8 adolescents, have clinical depression, according to the Center of Mental Health Services in the United States. Women experience depression at twice the rate at men. The two, point, uh, the two to one ratio exists regardless of racial or ethnic background or economic status. Isn't that interesting? Now, there doesn't matter what your background is about, two to one as far as the women having depression over men. The lifetime prevalence of major depression is 20 to 26% for women and 8 to 12% for men. So if you're a woman here, it's 32. Um, those stats don't really, uh, are not favorable. The economic impact of depression is huge in America. It's the leading cause for disability in the United States for ages uh, 15 to 44. Major depression is the leading cause for disability worldwide among persons five and older. Depression is the cause, now get this, this was really impacting. Depression is the cause of over two-thirds of the 30,000 reported suicides in the United States each year. 30,000. Two-thirds of that is what? 20,000. So 20,000 people die of suicide every year because of depression. For every two homicides committed in the United States, there are three suicides. The suicide rate for older adults is more than 50% higher than the rate for the nation as a whole. Up to two-thirds of older adult suicides are attributed to untreated and undiagnosed depression. My brothers and sisters, depression is something that we got to deal with. How does the church respond to this? You see, if we say that we have an almighty God who is absolutely sovereign and af absolutely in control of everything, if we have that to be true, if we say that, if we believe that, then somebody comes up to us, has every right to come up to us and says, here's a problem, what does God say about it, right? Isn't that true? And we have to deal with it. So what is the what is the answer of God? What is the answer of the church? What is the answer of the scriptures to this worldwide epidemic, if you will, of depression. Now, whether you agree with all of the stats or not, they're there. But I want to tell you this morning with all of my heart that God has an answer for the depression of man. God has an answer for it. And it's not some hope in the sky, well, maybe this will work out. It is absolutely truthful. God, who, let me ask you this, who created man? God did. Does God now know how to solve the problems of man? Yes. So where we go when we've got a trouble or we've got a problem, we say to God, God, what do we do with this? How do we handle this? And God says, I've written a whole book for it, just for you and for this situation. Because I believe after studying preliminarily and throughout the years, the book of Philippians, God wrote the book of Philippians to deal with this issue. And it deals with your mind, because what's the theme? Let's see if you've got this. What's the theme of the book of Philippians? Mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. It deals with the mind of Christ within us. And that's the key for us in understanding what this book is all about. 
So as we go through this book, I'm going to ask for you to consider and to, to continue in your pursuit of understanding who God is to you from this book so that when you have, get this, when you have friends that God brings next to you, you have the ability to share with them how to have solutions for the depression that they're having. And you may be here this, you say, well, you know what, I'm a Christian, I shouldn't be depressed. Can I tell you something? There are Christians all the way through the Old Testament and New Testament who were depressed. And we're going to learn what depression is, and we're going to learn how to solve those things. Because God is able, I'm going to say this with all my heart, God is able to solve the problem of depression. God is able to do that. Do you believe that? Okay. See, what the world does, is, and I, the stats, I didn't read that, this particular one, but what the world does immediately puts you on medicine. Can I just caution you? Be careful. Now, if you're on depression medicine, I'm not ragging on you. I'm just saying this. Be careful. Sometimes we go so quickly to the chemicals or to the, the, the medicine before we even find out what are, the, what are the other things, what are the other options. And I will tell you that God in the life of a Christian is able to take those needs that you have, specifically need, and change your thought pattern. God is able to do that. And I, I have personally seen it done in the lives of individuals of Christians who thought they'd never get away from depression and now live in true joy. And a lot of it material comes from this book. Today's message, you're saying, how in the world are you going to get there now? Today's message is thank you, God. What's the combination? What's the, what's the connection between depression and gratitude? Is there a connection? And I will tell you, yes, there is. There is a connection between depression and and gratitude, and we're going to look at it this morning. So let's begin, start at verse 1, and let's dig right in, all right? I want you to see the first providential thought that is given to us in this book. Who is Paul? The first verse says, Paul, Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ. Who is Paul? You look anything about Paul's life, he's, he's a person who is uh, he was saved in 30 A.D. It is now around 60 A.D., so he's been a Christian about 30 years, and he's planted over 20 churches. You can find that in, in, in chapter 3 and verses 4 to 6. You can also find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He is a man that was at a vision of God. So here is Paul, the mighty man, the one that we look at, the one that we say, wow, this is quite a character. This is a real Christian, Paul. All right? And then who's Timothy? Well, Timothy was his protege. Timothy was, been, was his disciple. Timothy was the individual that, that was a third generation Christian. His mother and his grandmother were also Christian. He became the pastor of Ephesus. He was a church administrator. But I want you to look at, the, at the, about the, the fourth word of the book of Philippians. What does it say? Paul and Timothy. And what does it say? What's the next word? Bond servants. You can write this in, in, the, uh, in the little column on your Bible, write this word slave, because that's what it means. And we don't like the word slave, it has bad connotations, but that's exactly what that word means. It's not just a servant, because you can have a servant who is hired for you. This was a slave, this is an individual, Paul is saying bond slave. This is the guy that's the lowest on the totem pole. This is the guy who when somebody walked in from outside and had sewage on their feet, because back in that time, they walked in streets that were filled with sewage. And so they walked into a house and they would have this, the servant, the bond servant, the bond slave, this guy come in and he would wash everybody's feet and clean up them so that they could have a one. But he was dirty when it was all over. And Paul's the one who says, that's who we are. It's the first providential thought. If you're going, if you're going to understand about who God is and the thought process that we're dealing with here, you've got to see it in the life of Paul saying, I am a slave of Christ. You are a slave of God. Amen? That's who, you are a slave of God. Amen? Okay, I want to make sure you guys got that, all right? We are slaves before who God is. We are slaves. And when we start to think of ourselves as better than that, then we got a problem. But he doesn't leave us there. Go to the next verse, or go to the uh, latter part of this first verse. To all the what? Saints. What saints? I've been reading a book recently that talks about in the Roman Catholic Church that they, have, they, they uh, take people and they put them up to a position of being a saint. Okay? In the, in the Protestant Church, let me ask you a question. 
All Christians are what? Yeah, we're all saints. We're all saints, okay? We're all saints. And what does saints mean? Set apart, holy unto God. Okay? Agios is the, is the New Testament Greek word, and it simply means set apart, sanctified unto God. So here Paul, get this, Paul and Tim, Paul's saying this, Paul and Timothy, we're slaves, you're saints. See that? That gives you a key to understanding how we need to think of our lives. That means this, Will Lonus, slave of Jesus Christ, to the saints, any one of us, James, Mark, any one of us, Ron, that's how we have to think one another. But you know where our problems get into? We switch those. We start to look at our friends and say, you know, you're a slave from me, right? God says, no, 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 no. First thought pattern is this, and providential thinking of who you and I are, we are slaves of God. We are slaves of Christ. But we want to elevate ourselves. The bad news of salvation is that we're all sinners. So you can put these two words in your notes and simply says this, you are a sanctified sinner. That's who you are. And that's who I am. A sanctified sinner. Amen? Yes. Sanctified sinner. And when God has come and said, I want you, you're mine. I've called you before the foundation of the world. You are mine. Sanctified sinner. Amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a sanctified sinner. You can say it to me, brother. You don't have to worry about that. Center, me too, brother. Okay? We're sanctified sinners. And that's what the beginning of this whole book deals with. It's important to understand that. And then look at verse 2. God gives to us, in verse 2, it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is undeserved. It's granted by a sovereign will to finite and sinful and broken people. Don't try to earn it. Write that down on your notes. Don't try to earn grace. You'll never do it. Don't try to earn it. Don't dress a certain way so you can get in God's pleasure. Don't have your hairstyle so you can get in God's pleasure. Don't try to earn the grace of God. You never can. It's given to you. And that's where it becomes humbling because none of us can deserve, none of us can earn the grace of God. Amen? God just comes up and says, I give it to you. And the question that I ask oftentimes in my heart, God, why me? Sometimes I think God's up in heaven going, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, well, the answer is God says, because of me. Yeah. Amen. None of us deserve grace. And if you're learning how, and this whole book is about providential thinking, I put in the top of my, uh, of my new Bible, I put in the top, the theme is the, uh, the mind of Christ, and it's all about providential thinking. Providential thinking, the power of providential thinking. If you're learning how to think providentially, this is new for you. Remember this, that gratitude is the test. Gratitude is the test of providential thinking. If you're not thankful, you're not thinking providentially. Why? Simple question. You answer verbally straight up. Is God good? Is God good to you? Is God eternal? Can, is anything greater than God? No. So if He's in absolute control, and He is in charge, and He loves you, what's your problem? Well, I, it's hard. Get that. Got that. But who's in charge? God is. Is God going to take... Does God make us a promise in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28? For we know that what? Yeah, I don't know if I all is all all means all all the time. Uh, I'm not sure. All things work together for all things. If we had anybody stand up here, whoever's the oldest, and say, "In the Lord, if you're 50 years old in the Lord, has God ever been unfaithful to you?" I want to hear. Has God ever been unfaithful to you? Has God always been good to you? Now let's be honest, has God allowed stuff into your life that you really wish He wouldn't? Oh yeah. Has God allowed stuff into your life that you wish He's saying, God, come on, how and that's going to be good? But you go down the road a little bit and what? It's good. God will make it. Now it doesn't mean that it makes it easier. We lost our son, I still weep over that. That doesn't make it any better. I mean, God's not going to come in and say, oh, take that feeling away. I still hurt, but you know who's alongside of me when that goes through? God is. 
title of today's message in verses 1 to 11, as I mentioned, is that thank you, God. And that's the first lesson of providential thinking. Thank you, God. If you want, if you're in depression and if you're working through some issues like that, the first three words that I want you to always just start to retain is thank you, God. It's thank you, God. That starts to reprogram who you are before God and change your life. Gratitude is so essential to truth that without it, you're not going to learn truth. Living truth is dead to you if there is no gratitude in your heart. Also, relationships are empty and shallow because gratitude is the song of creation. It's in, in the uh, pages of history. What does it say in Psalm 19? The heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows its handiwork. You get in, in Re- Revelation chapter 5, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive honor and glory. What is all that? That's all gratitude. And there you have it in a nutshell. Our our lives are to be a banner of thanksgiving before God. Not just one day a year in thanksgiving, but as we study this through our lives, may it change our hearts. You know, you're in in small groups. What's your study that you're going through in small groups? Yeah, when God's people learn how to pray or when God's people pray. What does it say in Psalm 100? Anybody know Psalm 100? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all your land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His, come before His what? His presence with, and into His well, praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Okay, you got that. How are we to come in the presence of God? Thanksgiving. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Take thirty seconds. Real fast popcorn. What are you thankful to God for today? Just tell me. Rain. rain. What do you say? Um, okay. For rain, yes. Faithfulness. What else? Worship. Worship. Grace. 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 Mercy. Mercy. What else? Family. Pardon? Family. Family. What else? Family. Pardon? Family. Healing. Keep coming, keep coming. Love, mom and dad's anniversary. I'll get back to that later. Salvation, amen. Salvation. What else? Forg- oh, forgiveness. What else? Come on. Just speak it out. What else are you thankful to God for? His love for me is amen. Can all God's people say amen for that one? <laughs> amen, all right? <laughs> okay, amen. All right, but that's... That's true for all of us, right? Anybody here worthy of God's love? And we could could spend the next hour, we can forget the sermon, and we could just talk about the things that God has been faithful to us and for what we're thankful for. And when your mind starts saying those things and your mind starts to go on those things, you know what happens to your whole view of life? It changes. Yeah, but I I had cancer. There were times when this church wept over God allowing cancer into the life of, in our church. But this church also wept months later as the doctor continually said, there's no more cancer. Yeah. Amen? That's, that's God. See? There's three things I want you to see, and if you, you'll just circle these words, you'll get to see the, the, the passages that open up in front of us. In verse 4, the last word, uh, in verse um, 5, excuse me, for your f- fellowship in the what? Gospel. Underline, circle the word gospel. Paul is thankful for the gospel. Paul is thankful for the gospel. And I'll give you the other two words. In verse 7, the last word, you're partakers of me of grace. That's the second thing that Paul is thankful for. And number in verse 11, the third thing that Paul is thankful for is glory to the glory and praise of God. Those are the three things that divides this passage up. Paul is grateful, first of all, for the gospel. Now what I'm going to say to you today, you've got to hold on to because here's the point. There is no one and no thing that can take the gospel, grace, and glory from you. Amen? There is nothing. What about America? No way. Can the the, the American nation... Can it take you, can ISIS, can any, any force on earth, can anything take the gospel away from you? No. 
Can the devils take the gospel away from you? No. Can hell take the gospel away from you? No. Nothing can take it away from you. Can, can anything in this world take grace away from you? No. You cannot live in it. What do I mean? You can live in a way that is not grace-filled. But no power can take it away from you because God has given it to you. And let me ask you one last question and we'll get into the first point. Can any power on this earth or off of this earth, any power, and I mean any, meaning God do, can any power take glory away from a Christian? Can any power take heaven away from you? No. Can God? No. Why? Because he's on the opposite side. And see, when God says, I go to prepare a place for you, nobody can take it away from you. No one, Christ said, can take you out of his hand. Amen? No one. So no matter what happens in life, no matter what transpires in life, no one can take away the gospel from your life, grace from your life, and the glory that's to come. Those three things Paul is thankful for, and we're going to look at that as we move through this text. In verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I remember that verse because in college, all the lame brain dudes would send that to their girlfriends. They had a note system, and they would send notes to the girl, their girlfriends. And I would, constant Philippians 1, 3, you know. And they would sit next to each other in the snack shop, and they would goo-goo at each other. And I thank my God forever. Get over it, dude, all right? That's not what that verse is talking about, all right? But that's what Paul was saying here. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day into now. God is the basis of gratitude. Write that down in your notes. God is the basis of gratitude. God is the source of gratitude as shown in the gospel. Thanking God precedes thanking other individuals. I want you to turn on, on your notes. I want you to turn to the back of your notes. Whole sheet of paper that's free there. <clears throat> and I'm going to write, I want you to write down, uh, write down the word, a list of antidepressants. Okay? If you do that, a list of antidepressants. What are antidepressants? Pardon? Mood lifting stabilizers. They're chemical stuff that you put in your body and make you happy. All right? Americans want to be happy. What does it say in the, uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence? Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Europe, I just was reading an article, Europe laughs at America because they're so, they're so tied up with wanting to be happy. Yeah, that was in our founding document. And I, and I can say to you, God wants you to be happy. And the way to be happy is His way. And that's by having meaning in life. And that's what's important. But here, Paul makes this statement. Humanity desires happiness. The important truth is this. I want you to get this, and you can write this down. It's going to come up on the screen. It is not happy people who are grateful, but grateful people who are happy. It is not happy people who are grateful. It is not happy people who are grateful, but grateful or thankful people who are happy. Do you get that? Why is that so important? Because people want, to make the, people want to make the case, well, I just got to be happy, I just got to be happy. And then I'll be grateful. If you just give me all that I want, then I'm going to be grateful. No, no, no. You're grateful for what you have, and that makes you happy. Paul is making the statement here. Now, where is Paul at this time, by the way? Where's Paul? He's in the, the Roman Hotel of the Ages, right? He's in prison. He's chained in his, in his apartment. He's, he's chained to his, to his uh, soldier, Roman soldier. 
And you would think that this guy who's been put on the shelf, in fact, that's what people were saying about him. They were saying, you know what, God has given Paul up. He, he hasn't been faithful to God, and God has just taken him out of the scene. And that's tough to say, because you can't, you can't put it on the Internet back at that time and say, by the way, God is still using me. But a person could go to Ephesus and say, by the way, the guy that started this church, his name is Paul, you know where God has gone? Because God couldn't control him, or God wanted to control him, and so he put him in prison. God's not using Paul anymore. Those are the things that were being said about Paul. And how is Paul going to fit it? Paul wrote the letters. But here, if Paul is in jail, and he says, no, 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 no. He said, that's not true what they're saying. God is still using me. God is still working in my life. So every prayer that Paul used, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. Every prayer of Paul is filled with gratitude and joy to God because he thanks God by every reminder of the Philippians. He is making requests to God for them. Paul writes of his prayer request in verses 9 and 10, and we'll get to that at the very end of the, of the message. Paul is grateful for their support. Look in the next verse. Fellowship of the gospel. What are we talking about there? Well, the Philippians entered into the ministry of Paul through the gifts of financial support. Look at chapter 4 of this book, chapter, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, in other words, when I started to present the gospel out to the Gentiles, in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving, and receiving, but you only. Philippians, that's Philippian church, was the only church that said, you know what, Paul, we know you're going to be in financial need. We're sending you money. We're going to give you some money. And they did that two times. You can find the other one in Acts chapter 18 and, and 2 Corinthians chapter 11. They entered into the ministry with Paul with financial support. And Paul visited Philippi for the first time in Acts chapter 16. He met a woman whose name was Lydia, and she was a seller of purple. She was a wealthy woman. And as soon as she was converted, she wanted them to stay in, at her house. And this is what I just want. I, I, I want you to write this down as an application in your notes. The gospel makes giving machines. The gospel makes giving machines. When a person's heart really is transformed by God, now I'll get back to that antipresence a little bit later. I just wanted you to put that list there because we're we'll hit that a little bit later. When the gospel affects into the soul of an individual, it makes them into a giving machine. And the biggest problem that we have is when people say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm living in grace and I'm loving God and He's really blessing my life, but I'm as stingy as they come. No, no, no. When you are a person of grace, when you've received the grace of God, you're just giving out all the time. You meet people that have been blessed by God and they're living out of grace. They don't want to keep their money. They want to give it away. That's why we here, we don't, want to, we don't want to keep the money that comes in from, from your giving to the Lord. We want to keep that here. We want to give it out. We want to give it to missionaries. Man, it's delightful to hear that, that testimony this morning. I got a note from Philip, and he said, you wouldn't believe all the stuff that we can do for $3,000. Because over there, that's like about ten dollars to $15,000. They bought food for an entire village because you gave to them. Well, why are you giving? You don't even know Philip. He may be coming uh, in Easter time, but you don't even know him. Why are you giving? Well, there's a need. Well, why, why is that? In, there's a ton of people that know about need, but they're not giving. What's the difference? Because you live in grace. And as you walk over there and you put that check or that, that cash into that box over there, why are you doing that? Because you're saying, I've been given. It's been given to me. God has blessed my life. I'm living in grace. I want to give back. It's a natural flavor. If you are not living in a giving lifestyle, you're not enjoying grace as God wants you to enjoy it. Paul lived out his life in giving because he received so much. And he says, every prayer of mine comes from a heart that's giving to the Lord. You have given to me in the ministry and I want to give back. The gospel makes people into giving machines. So if you're selfish this morning, if your maid or your children or your parents think you're a selfish individual, you need to check out, are you living in grace? The gospel is the basis for fellowship that Paul says there. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. It's the basis also for confidence. And I want you to get this verse because this is the big one. And I, I would ask in your Bible that you're bringing, of course, um, 
Verse, I want you to underline verse 6 because verse 6 is just a fantastic. Okay? Being confident of this very thing. Now, I want you to get this because this is the verse you go to. This is a providential thinking verse. Being confident of this very thing. That he which has begun, has God worked, begun a good work in you, brother? Has God worked in your life, James? Has he started a work in you? Sister, has is, is God started a work? God started a work in these three. And what does that verse say? Being confident of the very thing that he which has begun a Good work in you will what? Will complete it. Now that goes against what the evil one tries to pump into your head and your own flesh seeks to tell you. Because your flesh says, you know what, you're washed up. You fail all the time. You don't deserve grace. You don't deserve even going to... You may not even be a Christian. You get that pumped into your head all the time by the world. And God is saying, wait a second, being confident of the very thing. He which has begun a good work. He which has begun a good work will complete it. Not halfway will complete it into the day of Jesus. That's something that I want you to memorize, that I want you to hold on to, that I want you to keep close to your heart. Women, get this into your soul. What God has begun in you, let's take take it a little bit more of faith. What God has begun in your husband, what? According to that verse, what? He's going to complete it. It may not be in your time, it may not be according to your schedule. It may not be according to, oh, God, you're, you're, I mean, you're missing this whole section over here that needs a change in his life. Did you see this, God? God says, I'm going to take care of that. Get out of the way. Right? Because this numbskull has got a lot of difficulties. And as long as you're standing there, I can't get out of the way. And let me deal with him. Being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work will complete it. That's the signature of the Almighty God. He has signed his name and said he will complete what he has begun. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the what? Author. Author means what? Originator, beginner, right? The author and what? Finisher. God has never not completed what He has begun. And He will complete it in your life, brother. Jimmy, God is going to use you and minister into your life to other people because He started a good work in you. Jimmy, He's going to bless you so that you can bless others. Michelle is going to be there and she'll watch it. I've sat down and I've talked with you guys about your testimony. God is doing a work in your life. He's going to complete it because He said He's your God and nothing's going to stop it. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, uh, and this you're going to have to turn there. Okay, you're in Philippians. Where is Ephesians? This isn't hard, okay? Okay, left, go left, all right? Two pages in my new Bible that I just got, okay? And it's a lot of swipes on the page. If you'd bring your Bible, you could just turn the page, brother. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 10, because this is an important passage, Okay? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. You guys know this. All right? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Page uh, 1028. You've got the inspired Bible. Okay? (laughs) Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are His. Now we're going to listen to all of this stuff. Okay? For we are His. What do you have? Workmanship. Anybody got something different than workmanship? Real loud. What? Master, we are his masterpiece. Somebody else? Handiwork. Anybody else? That word, you can write this in the column of it. That word is poem. I got a picture of it. I can put that up. You are God's poetry. And you can't see... Uh, it didn't come out at the very bottom, all right? Poema is the Greek word. And that's where we get our word in English, Poem. You get this? You are God's poem. And guess when he's going to recite that poem? All through eternity. He's going to bring up Matt Johnson. It's going to be a Matt Johnson poem. Jessica's help writing it. All right? But that poem's going to be there and God's going to say, you see my poem? Now, if you're like me, when you're... Anybody, anybody in here has ever written poem 
One of the things that, that really bugged me about Greg Page when he first came to our church is if, I don't know if you remember, the first year he was here, he just, he just destroyed all the men in the church, all right? <laughs> because he was having his anniversary with Fania. I don't know if you remember that. And he, write, he wrote a poem. And, he, and all of us dweebs, you know, we've never done any of that. And she is smiling and happy. And my wife looked and has never looked the same at me after that. <laughs> Okay. Now, I can't write poems. I can't do that, all right? But there are some people that can do that. And, and I, so, but she, he was expressing his love for his wife. God is expressing his love for us by creating a, us as his poem. And it's hard work if you ever want to write a poem. I tried it and nobody's ever read it. Because... <laughs> I ripped it up as soon as I wrote it. <laughs> it's not very, very good. But God's poem is perfect. And he's writing you out. You are God's poetry. You are God's poetry. For we are his workmanship. That means God is working on us. Created unto good works. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know that God has got everything prepared for what he wants you to do in your life. Now, I want you to listen carefully to this one. You may think, well, my life is blown. And I've made bad decisions. I, did. Uh, 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 uh. I tell you this right now. God knew it all before you did. And he's got something for you that he's going to use in your life that you're going to be so surprised when it happens, you say, only God. Amen? So don't start saying to God, I'm too bad. It won't work. God says, are you kidding me? I know exactly where I've got you. I know exactly what I wanted from you. And I am building a poem that's going to be so glorifying to God, it will bless the whole world around me. You say, well, I'm different than other individuals. Remember the, the, the movie uh, Chariots of Fire? That's one of my favorites. All right, Eric Liddell in that. He's a missionary. That story, by the way, get that, read that. One of the things that he said that really, I really, I love this. I love this. Um, he, he talked about, and this is what it said, and he said, I believe God made me for a purpose. But God also made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Now, some of us are fast, some of us are slow. Some of us are tall, some of us are short. God has made us exactly like he wants us to be. And when you act out according to how God wants you to act out, when you think of life according to how God wants you to think, you feel his pleasure. There's a shining from God that comes upon you. Now, this is all just the first point, as you can tell. We've got two, two more points, but they're not that long. The second, first, the second one that Paul is thankful for is grace. In verses 7 and 8, back to Philippians. Just that it is right for me to think this of you because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of me with grace. Paul is justified in believing in his confidence because he has them in his heart. He has them in his chains because they have ministered with him while he has been in prison. He has them when he defends and confirms the gospel. And in verse 8 it says that he greatly longs for them in the affection of Christ. Paul says that the Philippians are partakers of grace with him. Years ago, a pastor was walking home with one of the members in his church. And this member of this church was a judge. And the church had just had a, a service where they had they had preached the word of God and they had worship and then they had communion. And in this church, everybody kneeled as they partook of the, the uh, bread and the cup. And the pastor had noticed something very unusual. But as they walked home, the judge said to the pastor, did you notice who was kneeling beside me? The pastor said, yeah, I did notice. I didn't know if you did. He said, oh, I noticed. He was kneeling next to the judge. He was a criminal uh, judge uh, criminal court judge, right next to him on that Sunday was a criminal who had just been let out after years of being in jail. 
and he just let out of jail and he came to church because he had gotten saved at church. And by God's providence, the judge who condemned him or gave him the judgment to go to jail was kneeling, taking communion right next door to the criminal who had just gotten out. And the judge said, my, what a work of grace. And the pastor said, yes, that's true, very much a, a work of grace. But then the judge, as he tend to be, he looked at the pastor and he said, who did you think I was talking about? And the judge said, or the, the pastor said, well, of course, the criminal. He said, no, I was talking about me. And the pastor said, I, that's confusing, what do you mean? And he said this, that criminal, after being in jail for a decade, what did he have when he came out? Nothing. It's very easy for him to come to salvation. He doesn't have anything. So think about me. I grew up in a good home. I had a mom and dad who loved me. I was sent to the best schools. I was taught as a young man to tell the truth and my word was my bond. I was taught as a young man to be a kind and generous individual. I went, to the, I went to Yale, he said. I got my degree. I've had nothing but success all of my life. He said, no. The greatest display of grace was that God would take this arrogant individual who has always done everything right and make him realize how much he needs God. That's true. And that was Paul's heart. Never thought about it that way. It took much more grace to forgive all the pride and all the self-deception, self-deception, he said, to get me to admit that I have no better in God, no better in God's eyes than the convict that I sent to the prison. See, three times it says in scriptures, God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 3 and James 4 and 1 Peter 5, and God's making the statement, God gives grace to the humble. Write this down on your notes. Humility is the ticket for grace. Humility is the ticket for grace. And we'll go to the last point and be done. Paul is grateful for glory. Paul's final gratitude, and this is found in the final verse when he prays three things. And by the way, let me encourage you, we'll talk about this in just a moment, but pray for one another. In verse 9 it says, And I pray that your love may abound still more and more. Verse 10 it says, That you may approve the things that are excellent, and that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Jesus Christ. Those are three great prayers that you can use. You pray for one another. Paul is grateful for the glory that says, to the glory and praise of God. Be filled with, in verse 11, it says, be filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise of God. I encourage you to pray for one another. And now you can turn your page and, and uh, go to the, la turn over your notes to the last one. I want to give you five things, and this is for all of you I'm sorry, I'd, LCD, not LCD. Who are, what, what is it? Not ADD, OCD, OCD, okay, okay, OCD. All right, all right, you got a, you got a frail pastor, okay, OCD guys. Here's five of them, I want you to get them all, all right? These are the antidepressants I want you to hold on to. Number one, if you're in a trouble with depression, these five things, I want you to, you can apply them, they're real simple. Number one. Thank God for the gospel, present grace, and future grace, or future glory. Thank God for the gospel, present grace, and future glory. Listen to me carefully. If you are struggling in depression, start thanking God for the gospel. Start thanking God for the grace that you have. Start thanking God for the future that's coming. Start thanking God. Turn to your neighbor and say to your neighbor, Thank God. Okay? And then say to your neighbor, thank God for grace. 
And thank God for glory. Thank God. I can, I can almost make you a promise. If you or when you start to draw into depression, I can guarantee you you're not in a grateful spirit before a holy God. Doesn't happen. You're either choosing one where you're saying, look at all the crap that I'm living in and look at all the junk that's right here. Or you're saying, God, all that stuff that's over there, you've got it all planned out. It's going to work. And I thank you for grace. I thank you for the gospel. that you. I thank you for the grace. You see what I'm saying? You start to verbal and say it out in your mouth. God, thank you. I thank you. We thank you, God. That's what Paul says. That's what he's giving there in verse, in verse 3. I thank God. I thank God. So it's a, it's a choice here that you're making. I'm going to think about all the junk that I've got and all the bad stuff that's happening. I'm going to be thanking God for all the things that are here and now and it's going to be in the future. You get that? It doesn't change your circumstance. What it does is change your perspective. All right, number two. Think providentially about yourself as a sanctified sinner, verse one. Think, think providentially about yourself as a sanctified sinner. Number three, you'll see this in verse seven. Develop relationships through loving others. Develop relationships through loving others. Let's just be real honest here this morning. You you talk to me. And you can use me as the illustration. When Will is depressed, who is Will thinking about? Will's not thinking about God. He's not thinking about helping other people. You know what he's thinking about? Will. And that's a sure subject for depression. See. Develop relationships through loving of others. Number four, pray for God's blessing on others. You can use verses 9 and 10 for that. Pray for God's blessing on others. When you're feeling the worst, pray for God's blessing on others. What do we usually do when we're feeling the worst? God bless me. Paul's here, he's giving he's asking God to bless others. And the final one is when you don't know what to do, pour out cups of water. What in the world are you talking about? It's the entire book of Philippians. Cups of water. Jesus Christ said, When you give to another a cup of water in my name, what? You will not lose your reward. A preacher one time, and it's not me, although he bears my name, a preacher one time, was challenged by someone to just give thanks to other people. And this is a true story. I know it. He began to think about that, and all the thought that came to his mind was a school teacher that he had when he was real young. Took up a pen, got a note, and sent her a note. She was an English school teacher that had taught him how to enjoy poetry and English and all of that. And he wrote a note to her and he just wanted to tell her, thank you for your influence in my life. Four days, she, he got a letter back. And this is what the reply was. My dear Willie, that was the pastor's name. I can't tell you how much your note meant to me. I'm in my 80s, living alone in a small room, cooking my own meals, lonely. And like the last leaf of autumn, lingering behind. What a, you can tell she's in English. You will be interested to know that I taught in school for over 50 years, and yours is the first note of appreciation I've ever received. It came on a blue, cold morning, and it cheered me as nothing has done in many years. I could probably ask the teachers who are here this morning, how many notes of appreciations have you received? Not a lot. The preacher found himself weeping over the note that he got back from the teacher. So he thought of a thought of somebody else, a kindly bishop that he had known that had been his mentor and he wrote him a note. He knew that the man's wife had just died. He was older. He was in his 80s. And he wrote a note to him, thanking him for mentoring him in the ministry. 
And he got a note back in two days and it said this, My dear Will, your letter was so beautiful, so real, that as I sat reading it in my study, tears fell from my eyes, tears of gratitude. And before I realized what I was doing, I rose from my chair and I called her name to share it with her, forgetting she was gone. You'll never know how much your letter has warmed my spirit. I've been walking around in the glow of your letter all day long. Let me encourage you. When you don't do any, know any else to do, write a note of appreciation to somebody. You ever gotten a note like that? Somebody just wrote, Dear Jim, thanks for your blessing in my life. Simple. You've got a lines on the back of your paper and it says cups of water. Put somebody's name in all three of those spots and in the next month, write them a thank you note just to say, I love you and I'm praying for you. Or do something for them and I'll make you a promise. I'm making you a promise. You do that and you'll find your depression starting to flee away. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, despising shame, laid down his life. For consider him, it says in verse 3, for consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners. What? Lest you grow weary and... You know what the divine remedy for discouragement and depression is? Think about Jesus. I have never in... 30 years of ministry, met an individual who is depressed that's thinking about Jesus. You know what they're thinking about? Self and their circumstances. I ask them at times, are you giving out cups of water? Brothers and sisters, listen to me. All of us go through depression. It's how we handle it that matters. Let's pray.